it's looking like safe havens like oil are also getting hit. Now, is that going to stay that way or not? And you've been covering the oil industry a, a ton and reading everything, dang, about the oil industry. But you know what's going on there? Would you tell people to, to invest in these companies? They increase their dividends. They're reporting massive earnings. But yet, you've just seen this transition as maybe I should lighten up on oil over the past couple of weeks. I think that the pullback in oil right now is a good entry point if you are if you want to look to add exposure or if you don't have any exposure yet. I think the only better I'm going to mess that up, Frank. The only better opportunity on a pullback would be a ceasefire announcement between Russia and Ukraine, which I don't foresee happening very soon. I I was dead wrong on that. I I bought into what they were telling you. Would it be positive for oil or negative for oil prices? I think it would be like oil prices go up on that or down. No, I think they would go down, which would mean yeah. that would be the only better entry point because I think you'd get a pullback if yep. you have an announcement of a ceasefire. Yep, yep. I think everything would pull back, and that would be a good time to get in because the logistics and the inner workings are not fixable just because like your supply and demand isn't going to balance just because of Russia. So for instance, let's say Russia and Ukraine announce tomorrow mm -hmm. that they have a ceasefire. Well, if the world governments followed through and 24 hours later, which they never do anything that quickly, that would amount to anything. But if they followed through just 24 hours later and removed all sanctions, how long does that take to get through the pipeline and all that kind of stuff. Not going to happen. So I think that this is a good one. Uh, if you don't have any exposure, you want to increase it for a couple of reasons. One, remember the Panama Papers leak, Frank? Mm -hmm. We need to come up with a marketing tool about the Chevron Papers or the oil letters <laughs> or Biden's oil diary or something like that because there's a saga of, what am I, sitcom saga basically going on between Unfortunately, the most powerful industry, in my opinion, energy, and the governing superpower of the world, the United States government. Uh, have you been following this back and forth at all, yeah, Frank? Yeah, I have. I have. It just, okay. It's the reason why Exxon and these guys are really coming out, because they're really pissed off at, at what you know the president is saying. and, and you know, saying yes. that It's kind of their fault. It's all their fault. And they're like, you know, F you, basically. So earlier in June, which is now making much more sense, and we're going to talk about the guy behind the scenes here, because unlike I believe that Buffett, or excuse me, Buffett, I'm giving it away, that President Biden is doing everything on his own, I don't think the Chevron CEO is acting independently, and I like it a lot. A couple of weeks ago, early June, the CEO of Chevron did a sit-down interview with Bloomberg, and he said some pretty wild stuff, Frank. Do you know where I'm going with this? He used the word never. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, now I got to get the quote in front of me because I don't want to, I don't want to exaggerate this claim because it's important. He was talking about the two things you hear most about are drilling and Hey, you know, the administration is going to say, we got plenty of leases that are open to drill oil companies just are being greedy. They're not drilling. They're gouging the customers. Oil pri oil companies come back and say the leases you quote, they're not near half that they're still tied up in litigation, uh, permitting, all that kind of stuff. That's a big difference between getting oil out of the ground and getting it refined to where it goes into something like your gas or your, your truck or your car or your boat or whatever. So the Chevron CEO was calling out the administration and he says that there hasn't been a refinery built since the 70s. Did you know that, Frank? I wouldn't yes, have guessed that. I knew that. I, I would have hoped that it would have been a little bit better than that mm -hmm. or recent yeah. than that. Yep. He also said that he doesn't project another one to get built in the U.S. Why? Because these are multi-year, multi-billion dollar investments. And when you have a political organization or group of people that happens to be in power, and this is a quote from the Chevron CEO, at every level of the system, the policy of our government is to reduce demand. So it's very hard in a business where investments have a payout period of a decade or more. And the stated policy of the government for a long time has been to reduce demand for our products. Why would you invest over a decade? Mm -hmm. Billions of dollars when you know they're trying to get rid of your products for energy usage. Yeah. So that's a huge thing. Okay. This was a couple of weeks ago he did this. And I think it was because he knew it was coming when then the Biden administration writes a letter to all the oil executives, calls them greedy, blames them for everything, and says, just like a light switch, Frank, you need to increase your capacity for refining and get more gas out there available to consumers. Well, you don't have any new refineries being built. And even if they started breaking ground today, who knows how long that would take to get online mm -hmm. and B the existing refineries that you have that have tried to be expanded and or developed further run into policy permitting environmental concerns and all that. Not that any of that is not important, but it really holds back the desire here to really be energy independent. 
Frank, what is key about Chevron stock out of the other oil, major oil companies when it comes to shareholders and influence? Uh, it's Buffett, right? Buffett. Buffett's in there, yeah. Buffett owns what? 8% of Chevron? Does he own that much? I don't know. I, I believe it's 8%. Yeah. I, uh-huh. I, that was according to Capital IQ when I checked the other day. Now, if I'm the CEO of Chevron, I'm going to call Mr. Buffett and I'm going to ask him, hey, you do such great job at your annual letters and people have been reading them forever and you're, you know, you get to go on CNBC and nobody very rarely asks you difficult questions. So maybe he was asking for some penmanship favors to write this letter back to the administration, which I like this tongue in cheek. He says, um, Chevron will engage in this week's meeting with the Secretary Granholm. I encourage you to also send your senior advisors to this meeting so they too can engage in a robust conversation. Chevron shares your concerns over the highest price, higher prices that Americans are experiencing. Incre- and he says Chevron has increased capital expenditures, meaning money they're investing to get more oil, to $18 billion in 2020, 2022, which is 50% higher than last year. The reason I like this as a tongue in cheek thing is because the average person out there has full-time jobs and other lives outside of our full-time job here to study markets, Frank, but they can see through this. And what you want to do here is you want to have exposure to energy cri- energy companies to fight back against the high inflation. That's the big takeaway here. Mm-hmm. Hopefully it's entertaining and all that, mm-hmm. and we can get you to see that light or kind of make that connection. But that's the big takeaway here. You finally have oil company CEOs fighting back and standing up and saying, hey, this is what's going on. The problem for us in the midterm, short term, is that prices aren't going down anytime soon because you can't bring on refining capacity at very much of a, a larger scale than now. So that's aggravating. So I want you to forget politics for a second, which oh. is very difficult to do. I want you to forget what side of the aisle you're on because it doesn't matter. You're talking to me or the audience? I'm talking to everybody. <laughs> okay, because I know you're not going to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, w- I, want, I want you to forget what side of the aisle you're on. Now- the person coming in gets elected, and as he's campaigning, and a year or two before he gets elected, this is what he says, quoting, we are going to get rid of fossil fuels. Okay, no more coal plants. Uh, we should put them in jail. When he was talking about fossil fuel executives, I'm quoting, we should put them in jail. Uh, I'm endorsing a fracking ban when I get elected. Okay, this is whatever party you're from, whatever you, this person is about to control, right? And his, they're going to control the entire government, the entire government, right? All three branches. And this is what he's saying. And this is what he's doing. If you're an oil company, how to, I'm not going to curse. I want to curse to get the emotions out of me. How the hell are you going to go? Like you said, put pedal to the metal and make these massive, massive investments when you know that this person coming in is totally against your industry. Okay, how do you do that as a business, as someone who runs a business? And for Biden to say what he is saying right now, like, oh, I'm letting these guys drill and I'm trying, I'm opening up federal lands and all this shit, and all this investment, all this money they make, you know, they're giving away in dividends and, you know, with oil prices going higher and they're buying back stock. What the hell, what do you expect them to do? I mean, this is when you invest in these oil investments, and invest in oil fields. I mean, this takes years of capex. A, a massive amount of money comes in, and you're forcing people. And you have these asshole, you know. And I hate to say this because it's in my industry, and I won't even name them. But you know, the companies that own these massive ETFs have incredible voting power, and now you're forcing people who hate to drill on the board of Exxon Mobil. I mean, what do you expect them to do, right? So, you know, all this and or to really be blaming the oil companies, again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You're looking at the the people saying these people are a bunch of freaking idiots. Like they don't, they're going to believe anything I say. They're not going to do the research. They're not going to look into this. You know, we're going to make this a Democrat, Republic thing and they're rich oil companies and they screw everybody in the, mar- in the margins. And the funny thing is, is, you know, just the grandstanding that's been taking place from Biden. And, and, and the Democrats. And I get it. It's ahead of midterm elections, right? So you're going to make a big deal. Like calling out oil companies, how they should produce more, even though you did everything in your power uh, to prevent that, you know, to wean America off fossil fuels. You've been elected. Going after the refiners and their margins. This, I think, is hilarious because the reason why their margins are so high, these refiners, is because the White House has sold 150 million barrels of, of you know, from the strategic uh, oil reserve, petroleum reserve. And that oil, I don't want to get too technical. But that oil is like really, really high quality oil. It's called medium sour. 
It's like oil from Russia in the Middle East. It's the best. So it doesn't require lots of refinering. So when they're selling it, who the hell is buying it? Marathon and Valero is buying the shit out of that oil, meaning it's requiring less refining and they're increasing their margins. So now, because you're releasing out of strategic oil reserve, you're starting to attack the refiners because their margins are so high and how they're price gouging you know, everyone. Now, again, you're releasing that oil from the strategic petroleum reserve, which I find amazing, which by the way, I mean, there's calls when it, when it comes to this that uh, by October, we're going to be at 40-year lows, 40-year lows. So, you know, when you're looking at, at oil in general, when you're looking at strategic oil reserve and, and being depleted right now, what's going on? It, it's it's insane to me. I mean, it's going to be a low 358 million barrels by the end of October, right? It was 600 million to start the year. That's how much oil we released, actually, oil reserve, right? Petroleum reserve. And when you look at that, how much is being depleted, I look at Russia and all the sanctions and everything we place. Russia right now is in a massive position of strength. Massive position of strength. They didn't go to US and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're hearing a lot of, uh, you know, insiders are predicting that, you know, the latest round and where they're taking over after they take over a certain part, that there could be peace negotiations. They can go to all the countries right now. They can go to everybody. They can go all of Europe. They can go to the US and just say, hey, we'll do the negotiations and we'll stop this war and we'll have a peace agreement if you buy 300 million barrels of oil for us at a certain price. We won't announce it publicly, right? Just like whatever, the Cuban Missile Crisis and all that shit. But they in such a position and you're going to see food prices come down. You're going to see oil prices come down and Russia, again, U.S. And, and Europe is still going to say Russia is the enemy, they're the worst ever. They, you know, they're going to shit on them. They don't ever shit on China because everybody's getting paid, but they'll shit on, on Russia. And this is their opportunity. So I, I really think in the next couple of months, it's going to benefit Russia. It's going to benefit everyone if they're in that position to do that. We'll see. And a lot has to do with oil and food prices, and that can come. That could be a massive, massive catalyst for stocks. We'll see because you can't continue at this rate where you just you know throwing oil out there. They have no solutions. An eighteen cent tax, like you said, is. Three and a half percent tax. Yes, gas price is still going to be up seventy percent year over year, yeah. which is incredible, right? So, I mean, they were hovering around three dollars, and now what? They're, they're going to be four eighty. And is that your solution? That's your. So but he has to say something because midterm elections are coming up. Hey, so that's good though, companies. because for every ten gallons of gas you put in your car, what? That's a buck eighty in savings. <laughs> yeah, I know. and that's going to help you tremendously. Big but deal. It, what the, the thing that that surprised me, and, and this is so so you know we talk about the general state of the industry, but. The returns on oil stocks, over, I mean, oil's down pretty close to $100, down 20% off its highs two weeks ago, you know, 120 And the sell-off, like Pioneer, raising its dividend, I mean, it doesn't get better than that for companies like Pioneer. It, it went from 288 to 230 down 20%. Exxon was 105 three, three weeks ago. It's 88 uh, you look at Marathon was 33, it's 23, that's 30%. Halliburton, 43 to 31, that's a 30% decline. I mean, how do you own these oil stocks thinking, hey, I'm safe? And if you own if you own them a while ago, you're right. fine. You, you fucking kicked ass on these things. But a lot of people have been coming in lately because they're looking at the dynamics of oil and saying it should be $150, going to go a lot higher in all these stocks. But necessarily, that doesn't really translate into higher oil stocks. Now, if the commodity rises, it doesn't always – look at gold. Gold is held steady – you know, and trading near its all time high. Well, I don't know where it is today. Say nineteen hundred. You know, close to two thousand. I, I could tell you if you're looking at gold stocks. I mean, they're down incredibly, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't always translate into that. It should translate into higher profits. But it's interesting to see this trend. I mean, I don't know why it's coming down. Is it because that they're going to be attacked? They're going to be taxed at a higher rate? Do, is it the recession and people they think demand's going to fall off a cliff? But just to see these things really come back. Uh, they should be trading a lot higher for where oil prices are even $100, which is incredible. So I'm just surprised to see that move. And we'll have to, well, to your point, I mean, they had a massive run up higher. So there has to be, you can't, you can't fault anybody that's been in it for a while to have some profit taking. Oil did drop significantly. You have a lot of political headwinds. You have a lot of headlines that are trying their best to get down or to get the price of oil lower. And it has been, but now, so you're right, Frank, if you bought a month ago, oil stocks, you're upset because you're down 20 some percent on, like you said, what's supposed to be. Well, it is a great industry. It's a great, um, quote unquote, safe haven for things like that. Now, what do you do? Well, you have to evaluate that <clears throat> personally, but the bigger picture there, picture there is because of the volatility you're going to have across the board. That's why you want to scale into positions over time here. I think that's the big takeaway. Yeah. If your thesis have changed on the oil companies and you're down 20%, that was your stop, sell and move to the sidelines and look again later. 
However, if your thesis hasn't changed and you're only down because the entire market is down, I would pay close attention and I would think before selling in that scenario. And I, like I said, most people are buying month over month or every couple months as they get paid or they have some source of income. And I would definitely look to fill up those different buckets however you see fit because other than the price and other than the headlines that you read, nothing has changed in the oil markets and nothing will change for a long time unless policy changes. And the odds of that of are that, that to happen are very, very low. So therefore, you don't just don't get run over. You don't have to play in the industry and, and profit if you don't want to, but don't you know, don't ignore that and the impacts that uh, policies and things like that have on on consumers. And I know we can't, we don't have time today, but next podcast, uh, whenever that is, Frank, we'll talk about uh, the similar situation in metals and everything else, because these are rinse and repeat recipes, and we want to be able to help capture, help notify those and, and help uh, as many people as possible, you know, benefit from that when they happen. And, and as you were talking, I was just seeing, because I mean, they have moved up considerably, well, well but you have to you know, they also came down considerably, right? So you're saying, wow, they made a nice move to the upside. They have made a nice move to the upside. But when you compare markets and you compare, and the margins are much greater now than they've ever been. They're drilling for much, much cheaper. But we compare to certain times when we're looking at, uh, you know, so say uh, 2014, right? So you had 2013, oil prices were pretty much 90 to 100. It went up to 107 to, in 2014. If you're looking at the XLE, which is one of the largest uh, you know, oil ETFs, uh, I think it's producers and drillers. I mean, stocks are still down 30% from those levels. And we're looking at 107. We'll look at where prices are today. So they're down considerably. Their margins are greater. They're generating more profits. And just to see this pullback, believing that oil prices are going to maintain these levels or go higher, it's just, for me, it's a big surprise. It really is a big surprise. I mean, it's just, yeah, it just tells you that when you're in a deleveraging process, even the good names might be sold off.